Good morning, good afternoon, and for some good evening. I'm Max Hegblom, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on microbes versus metals. FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, invest in science. We're using our, the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support our community. So providing grants to scientists, organize and support conferences, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar series, which provides a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to continue despite the cancellation of in-person events. Each month, we are highlighting a different topic of microbial ecology. Fortunately, or unfortunately, we have many interesting topics to cover as the pandemic and various states of lockdown and restrictions continue. Also, if you missed our earlier webinars, they are available via the FEMS and OUP websites, so you can look these up. Today, we focus on the topic of microbes and metals. Metals and metalloids are the backbone of modern society, but also central to the lifestyles of many microorganisms. They have developed a highly sophisticated repertoire to traffic, metabolize, counteract, and exploit metals, either individually or in various types of communities. From respiration of metallic compounds to adjusting and responding to their extracellular environment, to merely surviving in the presence of metal polluted habitats, microbes have found ways to incorporate metals into their physiology and using surprising sets of mechanisms. These microbial processes are also key for the efficient recovery and reuse of critical elements. Our speakers today will highlight some of these fascinating metabolisms and our quests to decipher them. First, we have John Stoltz from the Department of Biological Sciences at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, who will talk about microbial sel selenium metabolism followed by Lucien Stajku from the Faculty of Biology, University of Warsaw in Poland on microbial biomineralization processes. Valentin Syriak, now at the Department of Biology, University of Copenhagen in Denmark, will uh, discuss metal-induced bacterial interactions in river sediment microbiomes. And finally, Ron Ormland, who is Emeritus Senior Scientist from the US Geological Survey, in Menlo Park, California, who pioneered arsenic and selenium biochemistry, will reflect on these discoveries with some salty and metallic tasting stories from the Great Basin Desert. So this is the lineup for, for today. After the talks, we will open the session for questions and discussion. So please submit your questions, comments via the uh, Q&A link. So with that, Let's get this going. And our first speaker, John, uh, selenium and microbes. You're on. Okay, great. So, Max, I want to thank you and FEMS Microbiology Ecology for uh, not only hosting this webinar, but also for uh, allowing Lucienne and I to uh, do this special issue. We've got some really amazing papers, and I'm really pleased with how it all turned out, despite the last year being in COVID lockdown. So. Uh, it's been very special. So I'm going to do a little brief introduction of selenium, which is actually a metalloid. So back in 2011, uh, our last speaker, Ron Ormland, and I, we published a book on um, microbial metal metabolism. And uh, during that time, we put together this periodic table. And what's really amazing, if you look at the different colors, this is like the microbes view of the periodic table almost two thirds of the elements in, in the periodic table are used in some biological process and by some microbe. And that includes some of the basic fundamental structures like, you know, everyone knows carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, et cetera, that, that uh, they're used in basic metabolism and structure. But uh, metals are also very important, important as cofactors and the like and even more so in things like respiration. And so today our focus is going to be on selenium 
and the fact that you know I, when I first started as an assistant professor, did not know that selenocysteine was the 21st amino acid. And so, for those of you who might not know that either, uh, you know, uh, I would like to introduce some of that to you. So, uh, as part of the, the review, and I must thank my uh, former student, Michael Wells. He was an amazing student and did an amazing thesis on selenium metabolism and uh, is the first author on our review uh, for the FEMS special issue. But uh, this brief history of selenium, uh, back in 1916, respiration via selenide was uh, established in Microcoscus selenicus. Um, and it was the first time that uh, you know selenium more or less was was thought of possibly as a source of energy. Over the years, as you can see, and I won't go through this in detail, but um, it became more obvious that there were things not only for resistance, because it turns out too much selenium can be a problem. It can cause certain diseases, uh, especially in cattle, for example, but a lack of selenium also leads to, to health impacts. And more so in, in microorganisms, as it turns out that in many microorganisms, selenium is an essential element. And so what, what, uh, why, what is that reason? And so now we understand that not only um, are there instances in which organisms are resistant to high concentrations, but more importantly, that they're actually, that selenium is incorporated into certain uh, essential enzymes and, and features. So that they also can be used for energy. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, as you can see here, uh, selenoproteins, what are those? Well, those are, uh, proteins that actually contain selenium and often selenium in the active site of those enzymes. So in 1954, selenium was a requirement for formate dehydrogenase N. Uh, if you do any sort of uh, bioinformatics, you will often see enzymes annotated as uh, anaerobic dehydrogenase, typically uh, selenocysteine containing. Um, and how do we know that? Well, uh, again, with the work that's been done over the years and we've reviewed uh, in this manuscript, uh, we understand now what selenoproteins are. So uh, just in brief, and it turns out that there are some major differences between selenium metabolism in archaea and selenium metabolism in bacteria summarized in this particular um, slide. But just to cut to the chase, over the years, a variety of different researchers have looked at both assimilatory processes and dissimilatory processes using selenium for assimilation. We know that there are at least now five genes that are specific to selenium metabolism. There's a selenocysteine synthase. Uh, cell B is an elongation factor that's involved in actually incorporating the selenocysteine into the protein of interest. Cell C encodes a, the t specific tRNA. So as I said, selenocysteine is the 21st amino acid. Um, interestingly enough, it's uh, encoded by a stop codon. And so the understanding is how do we know that, or how does the cell know? Well, because there's this interesting little hairpin loop in the uh, both the uh, the DNA and, of course, the expressed mRNA, and it's called the Cicus binding protein because it tells the cell, don't stop, keep going, and put a selenocysteine there. Uh, cell D is the selenophosphate synthase, and cell U, which is a rather recent discovery, uh, is involved in another assimilatory pathway in which selenium is not incorporated as selenocysteine, but just as selenium. All right, so getting to Michael's work, uh, one of the things we wanted to know back way back when in Mono Lake, uh, uh, Ron Ormelin's group discovered organisms that actually use selenium for uh, uh, energy generation as an ele uh, a terminal electron acceptor in, in both selenate and selenite. And uh, although uh, Joan Macy's group many years ago had uh, demonstrated selenate reduction uh, for respiration and identified it, uh, the selenate reductase, we didn't know what the selenite reductase was. So in the last few years, Michael has been working on this and he identified uh, a, a putative selenate, selenite reductase. And interestingly enough, the story gets even better because not only uh, do we have the putative enzyme and it belongs to a much larger group of enzymes uh, in the DMSO reductase family of enzymes, 
but it's related to polysulfide and thiosulfate reductases. And so uh, again, uh, this is very exciting because uh, Michael then was able to do a really deep dive, as we like to say, in deep time and looking at the various um, enzymes within the DMSO family. And it turns out that this clade here with the polysulfide reductase and the selenite reductase is a rather old clade. And so that's exciting too, because it suggests to us that selenate or selenite respiration is actually pretty ancient. And so if we look at uh, just how the different types are giving it within the time frame of geologic time, we can see that uh, again, that uh, selenite uh, respiration might indeed be very, very old. Uh, now getting back to our selenocysteine, well, it turns out that a lot of these um, enzymes have uh, selenocysteine at the active site. And uh, it also turns out that there are cysteine homologs. So then that raised another question, which came first, cysteine or selenocysteine? And again, through Michael's deep dive uh, into the protein record, we basically have come to the conclusion that actually selenocysteine was the, uh, the, the key amino acid and then subsequently cysteine replaced that. Lastly, and uh, to move things along, I'm probably going very, very fast, but that's okay. We can have more time for discussion. Uh, the true focus of the, the, the paper as well is looking at the selenium cycle. So what's really fascinating, people have made connections between the selenium cycle with sulfur, but there are some really, really unique differences. For example, when we get these methylated species of selenium, they're always in the minus two or fully reduced form. So that's kind of unique. And the other thing is, is that many environments have a robust um, selenium cycle in which uh, both selenate and selenite is reduced to elemental selenium. Uh, it's still a mystery and maybe Ron will uh, shed some light on this as well because the work that his group has done is basically, you know, how things get oxidized is still a, a true mystery because, you know, the at least looking at how the processes are going in the environment, uh, selenium oxidation is, is a minor constituent of this cycle. But it has to be because otherwise over the millennia we would have reduced all the selenium. So anyway, in, in conclusion, uh, selenium is definitely uh, uh, on the map as far as an essential element. Um, it's required in many selenoproteins or all selenoproteins. Selenocysteine is the 21st amino acid and it's encoded by a stop codon, but the secus element allows the cell to recognize the, or at least the protein synthesis machinery um, that it, you, you need to put a selenocysteine in there. And uh, I really hope, it is my hope that, that, that selenocysteine will make it into the basic biochemistry textbooks because I sure as heck didn't learn about it until I was a professor. So with that, I will uh, you know again, thank uh, my lab, thank Michael, and thank Ron for years of collaboration. And once again, Max and Lucien for putting together this, um, this great special issue. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Uh, really nice introduction. I already have a whole bunch of questions for you, but I will save them until to later. And um, again, also, if you have questions, please uh, submit them via the Q&A link, and we'll get to them then at the end of the uh, webinar. So we'll continue uh, with microbial biomineralization processes. And our next speaker is uh, Lucien Steku from the uh, University of Warsaw. Thank you, Max. Um, hello, everybody. Um, today I will be talking about uh, microbial biominerals. Um, it is a fascinating topic uh, because uh, biominerals um, is a research area that is at the boundary between um, several research directions, uh, for example, microbiology, physics, chemistry, mineralogy. So somehow it's a synthesis between uh, different areas of knowledge that uh, it's uh, truly um, remarkable. So um, today I will um, talk a bit about metals, uh, why they are important for our uh, society. Uh, then I will move to biominerals. Um, uh, we have a case study about uh, biogenic uh, lead sulfide. 
uh, that is the, the topic of the um, article that um, we published uh, in this thematic issue, and then uh, we conclude with uh, perspectives. So uh, metals, um, as you see here in blue, uh, practically they dominate the periodic tables, uh, table of the elements. Uh, they form the vast majority, uh, and also with the metalloids, uh, they, they occupy uh, most of the space. Uh, in red here, we have the, the lead, that is, uh, is the metal that uh, will be um, described in more detail uh, today. So in the, um, at the beginning of the human history, um, early humans realized that uh, uh, working with metals is not so productive. Um, so then they um, discovered metals. And we have several um, ages in, uh, in, in history. We have the Bronze Age, when the people discovered uh, this uh, wonderful alloy, uh, which, is a, which is a mixture of copper with um, antimony and with um, other um, uh, metals and metalloids. Um, then um, here in, uh, on the right, uh, you, you see some artifacts uh, belonging to this uh, time period. Uh, then people um, worked with iron and they learned how to, to improve its, uh, its quality. Um, and uh, also today we, we live in, a, in an age where metals are essential and I will show in the next slides. Um, this is the, the global metal production in uh, 2019. Uh, I chose this year because it's uh, the year before, before the pandemic when, when the, the industry was fully working. Uh, and you can see here on the, on the left, um, um, huge amounts of uh, aluminium that uh, were produced and consumed, but also copper, zinc, lead, um, uh, metals that uh, are highly used in the, in the economical uh, uh, production and in the, by the industry. Also, um, uh, we use a very important quantities of silver, gold, palladium, platinum, precious metals. Um, so practically this shows that metals are uh, essential for our, uh, for our human society. And um, in the future, we, we have to secure their, um, their safe production in order, in order to, to have um, um, good, good economic growth and, um, but also sustain, sustainable growth. And uh, this bring, uh, brings us to critical raw materials, um, or CRM. Um, these are materials that are uh, economically and strategically important for an economy, um, but on the other hand, they have a high risk associated with their supplies. So practically, this means they are very important, but uh, their supply is, um, is a bit at risk. And um, uh, different, um, different, um, uh, continents or different uh, associations develop this um, this kind of uh, tables, and I'm citing one from the European Community. Um, in 2017, they drafted the third list where um, um, there are 27 critical raw materials uh, listed, and as you can see, metals and metalloids occupy occupy 63 percent of this. And here I'm giving the examples in black, we have the metals and in green, the metalloids. This again shows the, the tremendous importance of metals uh, uh, for, our, for our society. Um, this is um, uh, an example of um, the demand for metals. Uh, you see here on the left, uh, aluminum, zinc, copper, there is like an exponential demand uh, with time. Um, but also on um, rare, rare, rare elements, uh, you heard today talking uh, a lot about this in the context of, uh, of electronics on uh, smartphones on, uh, or um, computers. And also their, their demand is, uh, is increasing exponentially. On the other hand, the, their supply is, is limited. So this brings us to the a very important uh, aspect, which is the, the, the conflict between uh, this exponential growth of the um, human population and uh, on the requirement of these uh, metals versus the finite, finite resources. Because metals, are unlike uh, other, uh, um, for example, uh, energy, um, uh, th th they cannot be replenished uh, easily. 
and um, here in uh, 1972, it was the first report of the Club of Rome. Um, it, it's, it's like a think tank, and um, they drafted this re report that is called Limits to Growth. And um, this practically shows that um, the exponential economic and population growth uh, cannot be met by finite um, uh, resources. So the, the solution for this is to, to ensure efficient recycling so that uh, the metals uh, return in the, in the economy after they are uh, used. Um, with regards to, to biological systems, uh, metals are also very important. Um, you, you see again the periodic table and um, uh, in, in black, um, some of the metals that are, um, that are essential for, uh, for microbes because they act as cofactors in various enzymes. They are also used um, to, to produce cellular energy. Uh, with regards to, um, to the relationship uh, of bacteria with metals, uh, it's like a very complex one. Uh, because metals on uh, one hand can be um, are essential uh, because the, they act as cofactors in enzymes. I'm giving some examples here, copper, iron, molybdenum. Um, on the other hand, uh, metals can be used to generate cellular energy or ATP. And uh, other examples, arsenic, iron, selenium, there are, uh, there are more metals that are involved in this. But also metals are toxic, and uh, uh, bacteria have developed various uh, strategies to counteract this toxicity. And here I color coded um, different different colors. Uh, for example, copper, uh, which is uh, the same time essential but toxic, um, or uh, iron that is essential but uh, it's also used in um, uh, anaerobic respiration. So this shows that the bacteria have developed ways to use metals in various ways, um, either to, to in a beneficial way, but also when they are toxic to, to, to counteract them. Um, in the case of biomineralization, um, this is a process that is uh, widely uh, employed by uh, living organisms. Um, uh, and they produce uh, minerals that are either crystalline or amorphous. Um, and uh, to date, there are more than 60 biominerals that, that are described. Uh, in the case of bacteria, uh, we can talk about two, two different aspects. We have a biologically induced bi uh, mineralization, uh, which is uh, commonly extracellular, and uh, we have a biologically controlled mineralization. Uh, in this case, um, uh, the, the microorganism controls the nucleation site, the growth, um, uh, the morphology, and the location of the of the mineral. So this is a, a process that is uh, highly regulated at the molecular level. Um, I'm giving some examples uh, of bi uh, microbial biominerals that they are uh, much more. Um, for example, in the case of iron, uh, you know that iron minerals uh, have a complex uh, geochemistry. Um, some examples are green rust, uh, Shebanella is involved in the uh, production of green rust. Uh, we have geotite, um, Gallionella, Ferruginea. Uh, on the other hand, we have, uh, we have magnetite, uh, some examples, Magnetospirillum, that uh, produce these um, this, uh, chains um, to orient in the geomagnetic field. Uh, we also have carbon, uh, calcium carbonate with uh, different uh, polymorphs, uh, calcite, uh, aragonite, uh, uh, betarite. Um, uh, some other examples, struvite, which is a phosphate mineral, uh, mixococcus uh, was shown to produce struvite. Um, there are also mono elements. So in this case, there are minerals that contain only one chemical element. Uh, uh, we have gold, we have elemental sulfur, elemental selenium, uh, but also, uh, uh, lead sulfide or galena, which will be the, um, the topic of this uh, of the second part of the talk. Um, here you see you can see two examples uh, on the on the right. Uh, we have a gallionella that is producing uh, iron stocks. This uh, this, this uh, beautiful uh, stocks here uh, on, on the right, and uh, another one we have uh, biogenic selenium produce, produced produced extracellularly. And uh, you see that it is nicely deposited at the, at the boundaries of the, of the cell. Um, with regards to, to the function of microbial biominerals, this is um, uh, somehow complicated and uh, uh, 
uh, a topic that needs uh, much more uh, investigation because uh, in contrast with the uh, with the plants or with uh, um, uh, animals where the biominerals have a function that is very well established in the case of bacteria the things uh, are not so clear because uh, oftentimes uh, biominerals uh, don't have an, an evident function in, uh, in bacteria and uh, because this uh, they are a byproduct of microbial metabolism or energy generation and some examples uh, we have barite we have various uh, iron minerals uh, we have ortiment um, here you, you can see in the image um, the, the yellow suspension uh, this is um, a mineral uh, formed by uh, the, the sulfutomaculum uh, uh, during the respiration of, uh, of arsenic um, uh, on the other hand um, biominerals are, are toxic and uh, the metals are toxic so biominerals are a way to detoxify them and uh, some examples are galena, um, lead phosphate, uh, elemental selenium, but also um, the, the bright side uh, biominerals can be beneficial and some ecological roles that I'm citing here in the case of monocotactic bacteria, they synthesize uh, magnetite and gregeite. These two minerals that have mag magnetic properties and um, they are used by this bacteria to orient in the geomagnetic field in search of uh, micro, uh, micro and uh, environments. Um, on the other hand, um, some biomineral energy generating uh, function. Uh, an example is volutin, which is uh, polyphosphates or um, elemental sulfur, which functions uh, for some uh, bacteria as an electron donor. Um, finally, we have um, a very puzzling um, example of um, elemental sel selenium that results from uh, respiratory processes that might appear to be an evolutionary dead end. Dead end. And uh, uh, currently we have a publication with uh, Larry Barton on this topic. We hope to be to, to have it published in the next uh, the next weeks. And uh, I encourage you, if you if you are interested in this topic, to to look for it and to um, to read it. Um, now we move to the to the case study, the the lead the sulfide. Um, lead is a um, post transition belonging to group uh, 14. Uh, it's a copper. This means that it's a copper lobbing is present in uh, with copper deposits. And its main uh, ore is uh, galena or lead sulfide. You see here on the right uh, an example of, of galena. Uh, as you know, um, lead is also a major anthropogenic pollut pollutant. Um, for example, today in the United States, I, I heard that uh, they want to, uh, to exchange all the lead um, uh, pumps, uh, the conduits, water conduits, because of, uh, of um, toxicity. Uh, and some um, sources of pollution of lead are uh, ore mining, uh, the production of lead acid batteries, and um, the burning of uh, fossil fuels. Um, so, um, uh, for this study, we used uh, a strain of Bacillus cereus uh, sensulatu. Uh, it, it's a strain that we, um, we named uh, Bacillus albuquerque, ABQ. Uh, Albuquerque is the capital of uh, New Mexico, and um, this strain was isolated by the team of uh, Larry Barton, who worked for many years in uh, at the University of uh, New Orleans, uh, of uh, New Mexico. And uh, th this bacterium has the capacity to degrade the uh, cysteine to, to hydrogen sulfate, and uh, it degrades uh, cysteine as a, a result of uh, lead toxicity. And uh, um, um, sulfide reacts with lead, uh, forming lead sulfide, which has a very high um, stability. You can see here the KSP, the solubility constant product, showing that uh, um, th this mineral is very is very stable. It's very insoluble. Uh, and here you can see on the right we have the control and we have the an incubation with uh, cysteine and uh, lead acetate, uh, leading to the formation of uh, black uh, lead sulfide. Uh, very interestingly, this strain cannot use uh, other uh, uh, sulfur sources to produce uh, sulfide, and we explored several. We, we tried the sulfate, we tried the thiosulfate, methionine, 
and it seems that it's only it's enzymatic machinery it's, it's only able to to degrade the to degrade cysteine and this is a, a research direction that we are, we are currently pursuing in Warsaw in collaboration with uh, uh, with um, our friends from abroad and so then um, um, uh, in this study we, we showed that that um, uh, lead, um, lead removal is uh, time dependent is, uh, and is biotic. It, uh, it's related to, to this strain. Uh, and cysteine degradation occurs intracellularly, but the formation of lead sulfide is extracellular. And uh, moreover, uh, we show that um, these uh, minerals um, are crystalline and they have a very narrow size below 10 nanometers. Uh, you see here on the right the, the contours, the, the shapes of bacteria. And the black, um, like iron, uh, uh, like uh, metal uh, fillings, the, these are the, the crystal of uh, lead sulfide. Uh, then we we dried this uh, this uh, palette and we we performed um, uh, mineralogical analysis. Uh, we showed by X-ray diffraction that uh, the the mineral is uh, lead sulfide. Uh, or galena, then we perform high resolution uh, transmission electron microscopy. We characterize the crystals. Again, we show that, that uh, it's lead sulfide and uh, it's, it's uh, high purity. Um, here is a model that we proposed, uh, and um, I invite you to, to read uh, our publication for, uh, for more details about it. Um, so, in the case of lead toxicity, when bacteria is exposed to lead uh, toxicity, uh, it internalizes cysteine from the extracellular environment. Uh, cysteine is degraded uh, in the cytoplasm to hydrogen sulfide, which is released, and then it reacts with uh, with lead um, cation, forming uh, lead sulfide, the, the black dots. So, in this way, uh, lead cannot enter in the cell to produce uh, to have a toxicity. A reaction, but it's um, um, stopped outside the cell by forming an insoluble mineral. Um, the follow-up of this study, we are currently um, looking at the enzymes uh, that are responsible for cysteine degradation, and uh, we are also uh, having uh, an in-depth characterization of uh, various uh, so, uh, sulfur sources, and uh, we are doing this in collaboration with Professor Daniela De Biasse from Rome. Uh, also, um, uh, we, are, we sequence the genome of, uh, of this strain, and uh, we plan to perform uh, transposon mutagenesis to determine the genetic determinants involved in uh, lead metabolism. This is a collaboration we are doing with um, Dr. Rob, Rob van Hout from, uh, from Belgium. Um, we also um, look at the insight. Uh, we, want, uh, we have an insight into the biomineralization process. We look at other metals like uh, iron, cadmium, cobalt, nickel. Um, that um, might also be precipitated. We want to understand the, the, uh, the complex uh, biogeochemistry of, uh, of uh, metal metabolism uh, in this strain. And um, finally, we plan to do a, a study on the re uh, lead recovery in form of PBS from industrial effluents. And we have um, uh, a candidate, uh, the wastewater released from uh, Lead, lead acid batteries, that, which contain a lot of uh, lead. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge my um, my research assistant from Warsaw, Paulina Guitovic, my collaborators from Poland. Uh, I also have many collaborators abroad, Larry Barton, uh, uh, Michali Postai from Hungary, he helped us a lot with the study, uh, Andreas Kapler uh, and Liane Benning uh, in Germany, Eric van Hulebusch in France. Uh, as I mentioned, Daniela de Biasse and uh, Rob van Hout, but also we have good collaborators in Spain, Mohamed Merun and uh, Encarnacion Ruiz Agudo, uh, also in Oviedo, we have a good collaboration. Um, uh, also, um, I would like to thank the National Science Center in Poland who funds my research, the various um, pro uh, other funding agencies and uh, uh, friends, um, for organizing this thematic issue and uh, this webinar. Uh, also, I would like to thank the participants to, the, to this webinar and uh, Max Hegblom for his uh, support. Uh, and with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to, to your questions and comments. Thank you. Well, thank you. Again, uh, please put uh, comments into the Q&A box and we'll get to them uh, then at the end of the webinar. So. Thank you, Lucien. Uh, we're going to continue on our metallic tour. 
and our next speaker is Valentin Syriak, now at the University of Copenhagen, and we go to river sediment microbiomes and their metal interactions. Valentin. Hi, everybody. And first of all, I would like to thank you, Max, for the invitation, as well as FEMS, and for the opportunity to present this work um, that I've been doing during my PhD in the University of Mons in Belgium, in the group of proteomics and microbiology. And during this PhD, I was interested in the interaction between metals and bacteria in river sediments, and more specifically, um, how microbial communities adapt to high metal concentrations in the environment. And we were particularly interested in sediments because they are known to be to host very dense and diverse microbial communities because they are sink for many compounds, including nutrients. It also means that they absorb a lot of metals and it has been shown that up to 99% of metals entering river actually end up in sediments. And this is because they absorb to clay and bind to many compounds such as organic matter, sulfides, carbonates, etc. And this absorption will actually define the bioavailability, so the degree and the rate uh, to which they will be available for living organisms. It also means that at high uh, concentrations, uh, an increasing bioavailability also leads to toxicity of these metals. Um, during the last century, the production of these metals increased sharply, and if lithium uh, problem is that metals is a limited resource. My problem is here is that it, co it comes along with um, with the pollution of the environment and an increasing pollution. As an example, um, our lab is working on uh, the Dirt River in North France that is located next to a foundry, Metal Rob. That was uh, that is responsible for the contamination of this river, um, the Dirt River. So we were interested in how the microbial community of the sediments of this river uh, actually adapt to this metal pollution. And to investigate this, we compared sediments from Metarop and upstream sediments that we sampled in Ferrand, uh, upstream the, con the contamination. Previous studies um, showed that the metal contamination in these metal sediments were very high um, and up to 30 times more contami uh, contaminated uh, for such, some metals such as cadmium, but they are also very con uh, concentrated in copper, lead and, and zinc. The same study um, characterized ferrin and metallurg sediments with meta, uh, metagenomics and metaproteomics, and they showed that uh, the diversity um, in metallurg sediments was very high, actually as high and in the control, when both considering Shannon index and, and the richness. They also shown that um, the dominant genera that are found in these sediments are very similar um, in ferrin and metallurg and that functionally uh, both microbial communities are also very similar. So here you have a metagenomic profile of Ferrin and Metaro. And you see also that uh, this study shows some uh, genes involved in metal resistance were enriched in metal impacted sediments. So we have two microbial communities upstream and downstream and metal contamination uh, that are very similar and the point of this study here was to have a closer look and a more detailed picture of the taxonomic profile of these communities to try to explain the adaptation considering of course uh, the metal contamination but also keeping in mind that other factors could be involved in the adaptation of these communities such as the release of wastewaters in the river or the farming activities surrounding the river. Um, we had uh, two approaches here. Uh, the first one was to sample sediments in situ from Enferra and Metarov, extract DNA and the RNA, and get the 16S RNA amplicon profile 
from these sediments. We also use conservative PCR to quantify some uh, plasmids. The second approach was to uh, go back to the control site in Ferrin, collect some sediments and monitor them over six months in microcosm. We used four of, them, four of them as a control and we added lead, cadmium, copper and zinc in four other microcosms to finally reach concentration found in the metallurg sediments. Over the six months, we uh, followed the the um, taxonomic profile of the communities every month, and we also use cumulative PCRs to um, to quantify some genes and plasmids. Um, co by combining these two approaches, uh, we expected to decipher uh, the mechanisms involved in the adaptation of these communities, uh, le and le leading to the ve this very high diversity in the metal contaminated spot. We then um, looked at what bacteria were resistant or sensitive to the metal, what could be the potential interaction that they are involved in uh, with the rest of the community, and if plasmids uh, could play a role in this adaptation process. The first, the first step was then to uh, check if this diversity was as high in metal rock as in fer. As you can see on the left graph here, there are the results in situ. Um, you have the richness index on the top graph and the channel index on the bottom one for both the DNA extract in gray and the RNA extract in white and ferrin and metallurg sediments. And you can see clearly here that the Shannon index is as high in metallurg than in ferrin, and the richness is even higher in the metal contaminated sediments. Um, in microcosm, we um, quantify these diversity indices uh, over the six months of the experiment. And you have um, in gray here the control uh, microcosm, and in dark gray the metal impacted microcosm for both the richness on the top and the Shannon index on the bottom. And you can see clearly that uh, the, the diversity of these sediments were maintained all over the experiment. And that after the six months, the diversity um, in metal impacted microcosm was even a bit higher. An important factor uh, in the experiment setup here is that daily we were renewing the supernatan water with fresh water that we sampled directly into the river. And by doing so, we were actually adding new living organisms, living bacteria in the system. And we load uh, a coalescence process, a mixing process between the community of the water and the community of all sediments. This is particularly um, relevant here, as we, we've seen in a previous experiment where the, uh, still, uh, the water added to the microcons was sterilized before addition. We, found, we, we showed that the, the Shannon index was decreased after the six months of, of incubation and metal impacted microcosm. So we believe that here we have a combined effect between uh, metal filtration for metal, for metal uh, resistant bacteria, but also a bottleneck uh, process due to the microcosm um, setup. Confirming here that this coalescence process might play a, a very um, important role in the adaptation of the community. Then um, we wanted to see what bacteria were significantly responding to the metal uh, first in situ here. And um, when, once we have found this uh, uh, significantly impacted bacteria, we drew a heat map with them. So each line is a bacteria, an OTU and each column is a sample, um, where, and the abundance is represented by the color, so a red color represents a high abundance of you. We have on the left of the heat map um, sample collected from the control sediments in Ferrin, and on the right of the heat map we have sample collected in metal rock uh, and metal impacted micro, uh, sediments for both uh, DNA and RNA extract for each. Um, and thanks to the heat map and the associate cl associated cluster, we could define groups of bacteria that were actually 
uh, behaving similarly um, in these sediments and get a closer look at what bacteria were enriched in metalluropsid in sediments if you consider the group in pink and orange here or what bacteria were sensitive to metal and um, almost absent in metalluropsid sediments if you consider the yellow and purple group here on the bottom of the heat map. An, an interesting group is um, the blue group here, so the fourth one, that include bacteria that were very present in the RNA um, um, samples of the metalluropsid sediments. Um, involving that these bacteria are most probably um, very active in the sediments and they count a lot of permicutes, clostridia, but also on bacteria that are known to be markers of fecal contamination. So it indicates that they might come from wastewater or uh, the fields and that the coalescence uh, and uh, participate to this coalescence process. Um, we're also interested in what kind of metal resistance this um, metal enriched bacteria from the group pink and orange were carrying. So we went through the literature for each OTU to see um, what kind of uh, resistance they could carry. And we actually considered two types of, of resistance, selfish resistance, such as um, um, metal pumps that actually benefit only the, the producer of the resistance system, but also cooperative system, including intracellular and extracellular sequestration, the production of exopolysaccharides, uh, that will decrease the bioavailability of the metals and then um, facilitate the growth of surrounding bacteria. And when we went back in this group, pink and orange hair of metal and rich bacteria, we found some that could be responsible responsible for, for this facilitation process uh, because they were known to precipitate metal, sequester them, or produce a lot of exopolysaccharides. Then we did the same exercise for all microcosm. Um, so here on the heat map, you have once again each OTU on the lines and the abundance in the corresponding sample. Um, on the left of the heat map, you have um, macrocosm control macrocosm samples and in, in blue and on the right of the heat map in red you have uh, the metal impacted macrocosm and you can see clearly that we, we have two groups here um, a group a of metal sensitive bacteria and a group b of metal enriched bacteria this group b was subdivided in four depending on the time of appearance of each of you um, and in these B groups, we looked for these facilitators bacteria and we found plenty of them. For example, we found uh, a lot of Zoglia and Legionella that are known to produce a lot of exopolysaccharides. Uh, we found bacteria that were uh, known to uh, precipitate metal and then decrease their bioavailability by producing polyphosphates uh, or sulfides, such as uh, Dichloromonas, Anaronia C, or sulfate reducing bacteria from the delta proteobacteria. Then we wanted to see um, how are these bacteria included in the community. So we used a dynamic network that actually identify bacteria that with a simultaneous or delayed occurrence in, in our microcosm to, to have a time-related uh, succession. And on the top graph here, you have um, our network um, as built from the control microcosm, and on the right here, you have the network from the metal impacted microcosm. Um, the first thing that we see is this um, high number of positive links between all members of the community and this blue cycle here that. Um, combined all OTU from um, Aneolina C, that I shown you before, were a facilitator of bacteria. And if you zoom on this uh, network and 
uh, have a look at the positive link that any kind of facility bacteria have with the community. We found that anaholinase, but also sulfate reducing bacteria in blue, uh, 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 dark blue here, uh, also zooglia and the chloromonas, where get had positive interaction with uh, many bacteria, but more importantly with uh, keystone species. One interesting keystone species is uh, Xanthobacter, um, because it's a nitrogen-fixing bacteria and might play uh, an essential role in the nitrogen cycle in these sediments. And the interaction with uh, facilitators bacteria could explain um, the resilience of this macro, macro community in metal impacted microcosm. Finally, we wanted to see if plas some plasmid were enriched in our system. On the left of the slide, you have the copy numbers of Inc. F, Inc. I, and Inc. P plasmids in situ. Um, and if you can see that in F and I plasmid were not enriched in uh, metal impacted sediments, they were indeed in for in P plasmid. And this is not really surprising as in P plasmid are broad or sponge plasmids so they can transfer easily to a very diverse range of bacteria. And they're known to carry a lot of antibiotic and metal resistant genes. So we wanted to see if um, these plasmids were also enriched in our metal impacted microcosm. So on the right graph here, you can see the evolution of uh, the relative proportion of this in P plasmid through time in the control microcosm in light gray and in the metal impacted microcosm in dark gray. And we're very disappointed to see that the proportion of this plasmid was increasing in the control, but where this enrichment was impeded by the presence of the metals. However, this, this can be explained as both metals and plasmids have a cost, a burden for the bacteria, and these cumulative costs uh, would impede uh, the acquisition of plasmids to avoid a loss of fitness. So if plasmids have a role in the adaptation of our microbial community, this could be on the long term um, where we could see the enrichment of plasmids actually carrying metal resistant genes. So to conclude, we have uh, two system here, two microbial communities, upstream and downstream uh, micro, uh, metal contamination, where the metal impacted community was very diverse. And this diversity that took place over 100 years um, could be the result of three processes and combined processes, a community coalescence process, bringing bacteria from upstream area of the river to the uh, metallurgic sediments, also bringing bacteria from surrounding environments such as wastewater or uh, the fields, surrounding fields. We have uh, potential facilitators bacteria in our sediments that will decrease the bioavailability of the metals and then allow other bacteria, more sensitive bacteria to thrive in the sediments. And finally, um, plasmid propagation if these sediments might have played a role on the long-term adaptation of these sediments. Um, but of course, all of all of this uh, hypothesis, all of, of this process must be investigated separately to actually confirm them. Um, with that, I would like to, to thank um, the Protme group from Belgium and my PhD supervisor, Rudy Watier and David Gillan, but also Augusta, who worked with me on this microcosm experiment. I would like to thank Gabriel from the um, University of Lille and Jonas from the University of Leipzig, Samuel, Joseph, and Sohan from the uh, University of uh, Copenhagen, where I'm doing my postdoc now. And finally, thank you all for your attention and waiting for your question at the end of this seminar. Well, thank you, Valentin. Some really interesting uh, community interactions around the metal. So we'll come back to to discussion. So thank you about that. So to wrap up the webinar, we have Ron Ormland, who's going to take us on a trip to the Great Basin Desert and give us some of the 
insights of what really went on in elucidating the geomicrobiology of arsenic and selenium. So Ron, it's a delight to have you here and hear about the history behind the discoveries. Thank you, Max, um, and thank uh, John and, and Lucian for uh, being involved and uh, for publishing that Got Selenium uh, retrospective. I do have a confession to make. Uh, in the couple of years since I've retired, uh, no longer having a lab or conducting any new research, uh, it's not so much fun for me to talk about science anymore because I have nothing new to contribute. But what I can contribute is a, is a perspective, sometimes tongue in cheek, uh, looking back on uh, what we accomplished and the interactions uh, that were involved that sometimes make fun stories. So with that in mind, uh, how do I get to my slides here? So uh, this is the title, Salty and Metallic Tasting Stories, mostly true because this goes back 40 years and I don't remember everything. Uh, this grows out of a, a chapter uh, that I was uh, asked to write in uh, the book uh, edited by Kristen Hurst, uh, Microbes, the Foundation Stone of the Biosphere. And it is in the very last section of the book that the party calls the adventure stories. <laughs> and with that in mind, let me see if I can call this up. Give me two seconds here. So who is this guy on the screen? That's uh, Gene Shepard, uh, one of the idols from my youth. And this was his theme song, uh, The Fibon. You may not know him, but I used to listen to him all the time on the radio when I was in my late teens and early 20s. He's famous for the movie, A Christmas Story, which is kind of a cult classic. So much for that. I always wanted to be able to do that. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read to you uh, the beginning of uh, this chapter that I wrote, the uh, part one, The Mono Basin and a Trip to Snarl. It was during the summer of 1978 when I first caught my first glimpse of Mono Lake as I descended from Tioga Pass, elevation 10,000 feet. Uh, located at the eastern entrance of Yosemite National Park. I was tasked with driving a field vehicle from this up to the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab, better known as SNARL, located about 25 miles south of Lee Vining in Mona Lake, near Mammoth Lakes, California. Now, the vehicle itself was an old surplus U.S. Postal Service Jeep with a clunky manual transmission and a very disconcerting tendency to alternately sway left and right as it meandered over the highway. Viewed from overhead, the Jeep would display an evident sine wave function as I drove it east across California's Central Valley. By the time I reached Manteca, I had learned how to drape my body uh, and chest and arms over the steering wheel as a necessary expedient uh, adaptation to dampen the amplitude of that sine wave so as not to veer into oncoming traffic or drive off that narrow two-lane highway. A further test of the efficacy of that tactic came as I ascended Old Priest Grade, a series of switchbacks that eventually brought me up to the foothills of Sierra Nevada's gentle western slope in the town of Groveland. I continued east along Highway 120 as it slowly rose towards the western entrance to Yosemite after which I stayed on Yotes uh, on 120 rather than descend into Yosemite's stable valley. <clears throat> the road gains altitude and emerges out of the forested region and continues along the exposed granite batholith with superlative views of the valley below, as well as half dome exposed mountain peaks and many stop and see vistas of exfoliating granite, rushing streams and other resplendent natural but wonders, <laughs> such as Tenaya Lake, let's see, uh, and Tuolumne Meadows. Compared to the very tame Catskill Mountains of my New York youth, pictured here, and five years spent in graduate school in very, very flat Florida, this was quite an eye-opening treat. Now, in descent, upon descending from Tioga Pass, I once again experienced driver's anxiety as nature's vista opened before me, 
snow covered nearly vertical, vertically ascending mountain peaks on either side of the road with precipitous chasm like cliff in between, uh, also known as glacier carved U shaped valleys. Uh, this is a thousand foot drop here. I sweated nervously as I struggled to keep on the, the Jeep on the road as it switched back and forth over the, its long descent. About halfway down, the gradient eased and the vista opened up to encompass the Mono Basin with its surrounding volcanic craters evident. Nevada's White Mountains of, in the distance. Uh, and with Mono Lake, Mono Lake itself resplendent to the foreground, as what appeared to be a vast inland sea. I clearly remember thinking, what the f is that? <laughs> as I drove down to where Route 120 intersects with Highway 395 and made a right turn and continued south towards Snarl. And then this route took me over Dead Man's Summit, elevation 8,000 feet, and by Convict Lake, all named after a posse caught up with a group of escaped convicts from Carson City in 1871 and commemorating the ensuing gunfight and outlaw recapture. <clears throat> this was the Wild West in every sense of the words. Yet, as far as Mona Lake was concerned, it was to be another six years before I began working there. I first had to cut my teeth on a smaller version located further east, Big Soda Lake, Nevada, as well as to experience my first genuine California earthquake while wading through Snarl's experimental streams later in that fall of 1978. So that's Mono Lake. There's Snarl. I actually made it there. And now a few pictures uh, to sum up my talk. That's Big Soda Lake, located by Bella, Nevada. Uh, it's the volcanic crater that blew up 20,000 years ago. John Stolls was there with me once. These were the early operations, me and Chuck Culbertson in this little tin boat. Uh, analyses were done on shore and some of the local interesting flora uh, that uh, adorned uh, the shores of Mona Lake back then. It's gotten better, uh, as I understand. We slowly, as we <coughs> Time went by, our operations uh, improved, our equipment improved, and uh, we would stay at uh, the Lariat Motel, which was another story in itself. And <clears throat> we've conducted the biological experiments on Big Soda Lake, uh, initially focused on methane uh, and its precursors, excuse me. There's a bacterial plate of photosynthetic bacteria evident uh, at 20 meters in the lake uh, during summer. Uh, you can see a vague pink tinge. It's ectothyroid ospora. And Chad uh, Saltikov is still working on that, uh, apparently, as, a, as an arsenic uh, oxidizing uh, capacity. But this is the same thing in, in Monolite. This is a hot spring on uh, Paoha Island. If you go ashore, coming out of the hot spring, you see these beautiful uh, biofilms uh, of uh, ectothyroid ospora. Uh, they're absolutely gorgeous. There, there's photosynthetic bacteria here that oxidize the arsenic-3 coming out of uh, uh, the hot springs, the arsenic-5 in the light. But when the light goes away, there are also anaerobic arsenate respirators that take the sulfide in the spring as their electron donor and oxidize the arsenate that was formed by the phototrophs uh, back to uh, arsenic-3 and, and give uh, a full cycle uh, to this process. But, you know, we, we look so much at gels and uh, uh, courses. This is what it, these guys look like. Uh, you take a portion of that biofilm and put them under a microscope. Uh, you really need to do this. This, this is, is mind-blowing. It's one thing to look at a gel and to do its sequencing of its uh, RNA or, or D DNA of the uh, isolated microorganisms. But this is what these guys look like under high power. Uh, and it blows my mind. There are slow movers, they're immobile, 
there are these long, fast, jetting uh, forms of all kinds. You just tear your hair out. <laughs> Uh, if you can get, if you're still amused by this, uh, you'll never get bored. And we eventually started uh, incorporating Motor Lake into our, our repertoire of summer uh, excursions. And we would come from Big Soda Lake way out here in Nevada and uh, enter uh, the Mono Basin and uh, set up operations. Uh, in uh, Lee Vining at that, uh, in a motel, the Lakeview Lodge, where we essentially made a laboratory. This is that hot spring uh, in Paoa Island. Uh, uh, this is volcanic gases uh, that you can smell, the hydrogen sulfide. Uh, it's really a neat place. This is a shot by Larry Miller looking west from that hot spring over the a portion of Paoa Island, which is just upraised sediment from a uh, uh, volcanic <coughs> uh, event some 500 years ago. And those are the, if you're in Nevada mountains, uh, in the background there in early fall after the first dusting of uh, snowfall. Finally, uh, although many people were involved in, in the work here over the years, um, it was a great place to study arsenic. Uh, the three of us, the three amigos, uh, Larry Miller and Chuck Culbertson, I think this was the last time we got together on the lake back in 1984 or so. Uh, and the many folks uh, that were involved in this process, in these studies, uh, it's a, it's, it was a wonderful experience. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ron. Uh, we will open this up to discussion questions on all of the uh, uh, speakers. So please join us back again. Uh, Ron, let me start with you immediately here. In terms of early work, I mean, now, yes, we're all taking it for granted that of course microbes can respire selenate or arsenate, but what was it early on in terms of why go into these toxic elements to start examining the microbes involved with them? Well, was it was it all uh, a fluke. Uh, as I wrote in my uh, chapter uh, or my piece for FEMS, uh, there was a pollution problem in the Kestis and Wildlife Refuge in uh, the San Joaquin Valley in California, uh, where uh, the birds, the migrating waterfowl came into this man-made marsh that received agricultural drainage water, which was rich in selenium. The birds came in, a lot of them died, uh, had teratogenic effects on their offspring, and it was attributed to a selenium pollution effect. And John Carlos, uh, our branch chief, then came down the hall and said, there's money available if you want to uh, start looking into selenium studies. And I was working on methane. I was happy to work on methane for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a little bit of money there, enough for a postdoc. And I said, what the hey? This is selenium being right under sulfur in the periodic table. This is all being done by sulfate-producing bacteria. It's going to be a breeze to do this. Wrong. <laughs> so we went out. Uh, we started looking at uh, demethylation of dimethyl selenide because that was related to some work. We were doing with dimethyl sulfide at the time, again, as a precursor of methane. And then just out of frustration, uh, we added selenate to uh, some anaerobic sediments and it disappeared and it became elemental selenium. And just tearing that apart, we stumbled on the fact that uh, bacteria were using the selenate as an electron acceptor and we're reducing it with organic electron donors to make elemental selenium. It's very, very obvious from this beautiful orange color. And then eventually yeah, we- No, the, the cultures are beautiful. They're wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like looking under the microscope. You get seduced by this. And we eventually paired up with John Stolls and others uh, who would jump in where we lacked uh, the expertise. Uh, they were more than eager and happy uh, to uh, uh, complement and, and work with us. Uh, and then from selenium, 
Uh, we jumped, we, just by chance, I threw in some arsenic, uh, arsenate into a test tube and the bug that we isolated, Sulfurous Burnum barnsii, it came in the next day and it was turbid. <laughs> just the opposite of what you'd have had effect. But Jody had gone out on maternity leave, uh, so I, I was lacking uh, people in the lab, but then I need Lavaman uh, who came in my lab and uh, teamed up with Phil Dowdle and, and Jody came back from maternity leave and we eventually started working with arsenic. And a lot more people knew about arsenic uh, and selenium toxicity and it just, it blossomed from there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, and it's been wonderful to follow how, how this field has continued. The, of course, you ha you've been isolating them from these wonderful uh, scenic areas, but I know that, I mean, one of our new arsenate respiring bacteria came from a wastewater treatment plant sewage sludge uh, inoculum, so they're everywhere. And this is actually a question both to you, John, and Ron as well. So now selenate and arsenate respires are routinely being isolated and they fall all over the place in terms of different phyla of the bacteria and archaea. And John, you alluded to this being a very ancient form of metabolism. So are you thinking that these have been maintained throughout evolution in these clades or is the lateral gene transfer later on with the selenate and arsenate reductase is moving on? Do you have evidence for one or the other? Well, in terms I, of what's I, happening? yeah, I think there, there are both, but clearly um, from what Michael has shown and going through and, and now looking into metagenomes as well, um, the ability to metabolize both selenium and arsenic are ancient traits. And I would say with Ron, one of the most exciting things, because I've been working on microbial communities for, for decades, um, and again, alternative sources of energy, and even with phototrophs, tying in that arsenite can be used as an electron donor in photosynthesis, because there you can have the complete cycle and the absence of molecular oxygen. Free oxygen is not required. And so you build total ecosystems with these alternative electron acceptors. And you know that to me is very exciting. And then of course, as an integral, I mean, I have no idea why Salino system is such a mystery to a lot of people. And, and the fact that that itself goes back a long time, at least what the proteins are telling us. So um, you know, the answer is the enzymes that are used to metabolize these elements are old and uh, their functions in, in biology is old. So actually here's a question from, from the uh, chat uh, about selenocysteine and cysteine in proteins. How does that change the function or does it? Well, again, that's a very interesting question because there are some basic differences and I think Michael is far more attuned to answer that, but there is a, a fundamental difference of how cysteine is and how selenocysteine, uh, given the radox conditions of, of the ancient earth. One of the first experiments we did when we uh, started working with uh, uh, selenate respiration, uh, there's a radioisotope of selenium. I think it's selenium-75, which is a gamma emitter. And uh, my postdoc at the time, Nissan Steinberg, and I, we said, let's work out a radioassay where we add radioactive selenate to the anaerobic sediments, let it incubate, and then take subsamples with time uh, because the selenate is going to elemental selenium and precipitate. We can wash away the selenate and just count the sediments. So with a gamma emitter, unlike sulfur, for example, you don't have to... Uh, work with uh, beta emitters. It just goes, you put it into a gamma counter as, as washed mud, and what's ever there, you're calling elemental selenium. And it worked really well. So we, we went out and we assayed, I don't know, about 10 different sediment types, running from pristine freshwater systems to uh, polluted uh, saline systems. And the big surprise was, first, they all reduced selenate 
this uh, selenate to elemental selenium in a linear fashion with no lag, and they all took off. The rates were different, uh, but they all were poised at 20, 20 net micromolar uh, selenate. So they all were tackling the same amount of selenate. And there was no lag. And uh, that sign kind of was a surprise to us because if this is an ancient enzyme, the bugs still have the ability to do this. Uh, and if there's selenium is introduced into their environment where it's not there, they're going to jump on it uh, and take advantage of it. So, and presumably because there was no lag, the enzymes are constitutive. Go think mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. So a number of the other genes involved in metal transformations are on plasmids or transposons. So you jump around and especially if it's detoxification. So Here's a question uh, actually from Joanne Santini about the plasmids. Uh, what about uncharacterized plasmid groups? Have you looked, so you have mainly the ink P group as dominant, but are there maybe other things that you you might be missing? Have you thought about that? We we quantified um, plasmids. We had the primers at disposition, but of course, maybe a lot of other plasmids. Um, and it's an explore. So as I say at the end of the presentation, uh, there's a lot of, of stuff to do with that. And another thing that could be done is with metagenomic to go and see what genes encoded by mobile genetic element, and if we have more resistance systems um, in material of sediments encoded by the mobile elements, then we could have a very broad picture of the mobility of these genes in the system. So yeah, so more to more to figure out on on this as well. Always more. Yep. Uh, and then let's see. Well, I'm looking through here on what's coming in for Lucian. Uh, this is about the lead sulfide. Is it sitting on the cell wall attached, or or is there a reaction occurring as the sulfide uh, species are are removed from the cell? So you said that there's internal production of sulfide that I guess then is released. So is there then some kind of a of a direct formation of, of the uh, lead on the on the surface? Um, so so yes definitely lead sulfide is present extracellularly. Uh, we did a um, very fine electron microscopy. We did not find any lead sulfide present uh, internally. Um, Maybe maybe it's attached also because of this uh, of the EPS um, from the surface. That's why it's uh, it's clusters there, uh, because usually we don't see it uh, freely in the in the extracellular environment, but it's it's attached to the to the surface of the cell. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So re really, it's a, is it a, just a, a very rapid reaction that occurs? Yes, as sulfide is released. Yep. So then, uh, let's see. This is one about we're talking about microbial systems now. Actually, we've all focused on mainly bacteria and archaea, and this is one question about fungi and metals. Anybody want to jump in in terms of what functions are similar or different than in bacteria or archaea? Well, well, Max. I mean, there's, there's also when you talk about fungi, are we talking about yeast, or are we talking about, um, you know, because there's there's been a lot done, especially with arsenic. I mean, the, one of the first resistance systems was worked out for Saccharomyces. So, yeah. um, you know, there and uh, there's definitely a linkage, and uh, even some of the bioremediation. Uh, technologies are based on fungi because they they are very fastidious and are able to mobilize things from rocks and etc. No, and, and again, the the question of respiration is probably not in the fungi with the, any of these, but well, it's but interesting. The detoxification was, systems are. When I was a graduate student, uh, a fellow graduate student, uh, Michael San Francisco who's now at uh, Texas Tech, um, found fungus growing on shikimic acid. 
and was puzzled of how this could possibly be. And then because he was working on nitrogen fixation, grew it up in some nitrogen free media and it grew. And we're like, whoa, what this, this would be amazing to find a nitrogen fixing fungus. But it, in the end, it turned out it was just an aspergillus, but it was incredibly good at stripping any trace nitrogen out of out of the air out of the media whatever and it wasn't nitrogen fixation it was just it was able to do it so yeah joanne santine is just commenting in here chelation methylation reduction as detox of microbial eukaryotes which is of course is actually many of the same systems that bacteria use right so th the question this is one other here about selenium how and why does it become toxic to bacteria? Does it di differ on the oxidation reduction state? You know, I've never, we, Ron, we haven't looked at that. We know like specifically with arsenic that they can be very susceptible to arsenite and for obvious reasons, but with uh, selenite and elemental selenium, whether or not, you know, we've, we've never pushed the limits. Uh, one observation was on the selenium uh, nanospheres uh, that we picked up later. We, we observed them early on when we started isolating these bugs, but only got an opportunity uh, to study them a bit further down the road. And when we had uh, transmission electron uh, micrographs done, uh, I, we were looking on them at the outside, but also internally, uh, there were lots and lots of selenium uh, nanospheres. Uh, so I inferred that selenium gets into the cell, uh, and once there, the bug wants to get rid of it, or if it can't get rid of it, it's going to precipitate it as elemental selenium, which is relatively harmless. Uh, but then there are so many of these nanospheres outside the cell, uh, it wasn't clear if it was being formed on the membrane, uh, where other uh, workers say that it's being formed internally and then being exported. Uh, it, it would it would be rather hard on the cell to do that because uh, the volume was immense. But I, I think of them as two processes going on. So internally, it's precipitation as a detoxification process, and externally, it's gaining energy. Uh, back to the uh, Galena question for Lucian. One thing we did see with the selenium nanospheres on the outside of the cell uh, when on a on a scanning electron microscope uh, graph, we saw a diaphanous uh, veil around them. Uh, there was something that they were encapsulated in uh, that you could see through. And workers in Holland uh, went on further to say that, well, there's uh, peptides associated with the, the biologically formed nanospheres, but not, uh, not obviously when you make them chemically. And some later work we did, uh, with Mitch Herbal was only the selenium nanospheres formed biologically can undergo further reduction to hydrogen selenide by bacteria, not the uh, uh, artificially produced chemically ones. So there's something the bugs are attacking, uh, attaching to those peptides and transfer their electrons to the biologically produced ones. Uh, there's a lot more mysteries there, yeah. at least for selenium. Yeah, if I can, if I can contribute a bit, uh, indeed, th these particles are uh, coated with, uh, with a biopolymer layer. Uh, we don't know at this moment is, if this layer is acquired from the extracellular environment or, or part of it. It's also contribution from the internal uh, environment of bacteria. Uh, but we know that it's it's um, negatively charged because um, we did some uh, some studies during my PhD in Netherlands and. Uh, we used uh, various uh, counter charge anions uh, and uh, we, we neutralized these particles and we sedimented. So this showed that in fact, this, um, this surface charge is negative, but it can be counteracted by counter ions. And, and it, it's interesting because this uh, negative charge contributes massively to its col colloidal stability. We left these particles like for five days in a sedimentation cone and less than 10% of it sedimented. Which, which is amazing because any any chemical system that you try to keep it uh, colloidal, it will not last so much. Yeah, and it's interesting also in terms of the concentrations that 
some of these trains can tolerate. I mean, I've, I think we've grown selenate respirers at 30 millimolar selenate, where one reviewer actually said, that's too toxic, they can't uh, survive it. And said, well, didn't you look at figure one? <laughs> where, where they were doing, but again, it, it's interesting in terms of, 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 of uh, really, I mean, concentrations way higher than they would actually ever encounter in the uh, natural environment. So there's selenate respires, selenite respires, arsenate respires. Joanne is asking, what about arsenite respiring bacteria? Are they out there? Well, the, the, uh, uh, arsenite is able to be used as a donor. So you got to think of your what respiration is. You have your donor and your acceptor. So arsenite is definitely um, uh, can be used as a donor. I think Joe has always wanted to see elemental arsenic being precipitated. Yeah. Just like yeah. elemental selenium is being precipitated. Uh, we've never stumbled upon that. Somebody someday may. But uh, the fact that we have a, a full arsenic cycle between arsenic three and arsenic five was enough to keep us busy for the rest of our careers and beyond. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's never say never regarding microbial activities. If you can gain energy from it somewhere, there's probably an organism that has figured it out. I would, I would agree. We just need to find it. Yeah, I like to call them odd couples. It's amazing what microbes are able to couple as far as reactions are concerned to make energy. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering uh, with Lucien, so you had the uh, cysteine linked to, to, uh, to lead. What about selenocysteine? <laughs> Uh, this 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 is a very very good observation because uh, um, my student uh, Paulina will uh, travel next month to to Rome um, to do a, a research stage with uh, Professor De Biase, uh, and we plan to um, to explore uh, more sulfur sources. For example, we have thiourea, uh, glutathione. What else we have? Taurine, elemental sulfur. Um, but also selenocysteine. Um, we, we, we want to see the full repertoire of this of this bug, and, and it will be it will be very interesting if uh, it extracts uh, sulfide only from cysteine, because this will be totally unusual. Not knowing that uh, sulfide um, sulfur is very important for, for microbial metabolism. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lesson there too, in the sense that because of the work that, that has been done, that arsenic has specific genes and selenium has specific genes, even though they are uh, you know, closely related to phosphate, say, and, and, and sulfur, but they're unique in their own way and there are unique pathways. And, and yes, they, they can sneak in various, you know, like arsenic sneaks in through phosphate pathways and selenium can masquerade as sulfur, but they're still unique pathways and, and enzymes involved uh, for arsenic and selenium. And we can then continue on the periodic table, go to antimony and so on. Exactly. So, so I think we are going to have to wrap this up. Great. I want to thank all of you, Ron, John, Lucy, and Valentin, and everybody here in the uh, audience. It's been a really interesting uh, session. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, again, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We didn't get to all of them, but uh, we'll send these by email and uh, then the speakers can respond later. And of course, finally, thanks to uh, the FEMS and OUP staff for making these webinars happen and all the work behind the scenes as well. So thank you all. And we may see you in end of May for our next topic on agriculture and uh, sustainable agriculture and soil microbiomes. So keep a uh, look out for posting on a new webinar in late May. But thank you again and take care.